All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Ben Chiriboga, the head of growth at Nexel, welcoming you to another Nexel fireside chat where we talk with experts in everything from legal design to social selling and everywhere in between about how the business of law is changing. Today, I am with two very good friends of mine, Dennis Potemkin and Tessa Manuelo, two experts whenever it comes to, hello everybody, two experts whenever it comes to the theme of legal design. Um, so what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about how design and legal can come together uh, to really make uh, both lawyers and clients' uh, lives much, much simpler. But I am not the expert. Uh, I am privileged to speak with two experts today, Dennis and Tessa, uh, about this topic. So let's go ahead and get into it. Before I read their bios, I just want to say hello and allow Dennis and Tessa to say hi. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hey, Ben. Yes. Hey, Tessa. Awesome to be yes. here. Yes, it is. It's awesome to have you. So let me give uh, everybody a very brief bio and embarrass them. I am going to uh, undersell them, uh, but for the sake of for the sake of brevity, uh, I'll go ahead and get into it uh, a little bit later. So who are we with today? Well, we are with uh, Tessa Manuelo and Dennis Potemkin. Tessa is a legal design pioneer. She is an internationally recognized speaker in the fields of and including legal design. She's a certified high performance coach. Uh, so definitely if you're thinking of one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, Tessa is there. And lastly, and most relevant to this conversation, she's considered one of the world's top references in the world of legal design. Um, and if that wasn't enough, she is also uh, the CEO and founder of Legal Creatives, which we will go into what Legal Creatives is, and Tessa is going to sort of explain that at the end of the conversation. So that's Tessa. Um, and we have Dennis Potemkin. Dennis Potemkin is the founder and CEO of Majoto, which is a contract automation tool, but not as you know it. And Dennis is gonna show you, you've probably heard of contract automation, but have you ever heard of contract automation with a layer of legal design? Um, Majoto is a contract automation tool, but it's a powerful alternative that sort of brings a next level of clarity to the design, the management and the agreement of contacts. And although there is so much more to Dennis, um, we'll just compact that. And in a previous life, Dennis was an in-house lawyer, a UK certified, um, I, be I believe, solicitor. He'll, he'll correct me for over 20, 20 years. Um, so Dennis has really uh, sort of developed from a practice uh, through design and now uh, the founder of a software company that has legal design at its core. Um, I am underselling both of our great uh, panelists today, but uh, we'll get into uh, a little bit more about their background. So hello and welcome everybody. And let's go ahead and get into the substance of the conversation today. Tessa, do you wanna take it and pick it up from here? Sure, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to get to share with your audience about what is legal design and how legal design can help as an innovation methodology. And I'm even more delighted to be in the presence of uh, my good friend, fellow innovator, Danis, because his tool is a phenomenal representation of what legal design truly is about. And so I also can't wait to get to hear Danis talk about his tool. Wonderful, I do. Dennis, do you? Uh, that was a that was a nice softball. Do you? Uh, do you want to talk a little bit, round out a little bit about how legal design and Majoto and sort of the vision as we sort of get into the conversation? Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll be I'll be very brief because Te you know Tess is going to you know tell us all about legal design and and you know in in, in its fullest. Um, I I, I want to start. Ben, you pronounced Majoto. Absolutely perfect. I know, I know. This is our this is our joke. Yes, right. <laughs> as really nice to hear. No, I mean, look, look. I mean, I, I do um, as well as uh, running Majoto. I, I consult on legal uh, on, on contract design and, and, and process improvement, and and basically everything that I'm doing um, in, in those sort of two capacities is all about you know making legal processes and especially contracts 
kind of simpler and, and work better. And the only way you can do that is by looking at things holistically. And the way, the only way you can really look at things holistically and in a customer centric way is by applying design thinking through applying legal design. So um, this is about sort of combining those two and um, the combination of the tech plus design is, is really, really powerful because you can do so much with without tech with design and you can do so much with tech together. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of two plus two because five. So um, hopefully we'll talk about that a bit more later on. We will. So that's a perfect segue into talking about what we are talking about, legal design. Man, I, you know, that's, uh, if you asked me 10 years ago how legal and design could work together, I thought maybe you would be discussing like a contract for a, uh, for redecorating my, uh, my, uh, my living room or something. But uh, there is a burst of uh, thought around how we can combine uh, law, uh, the legal code that underlines that law, as well as design thinking, which has been sort of popularized um, out of things like Stanford's design school, but has really sort of swept the nation. So Tessa, super difficult question, but what is legal design? Well, thank you for the question, Ben. Let's dive into it. What is legal design? Well, legal design is an innovation methodology. Against all odds, legal design is not just about designing visuals, although it may be the case, and you will see some examples, but it's really a methodology. And so what is this method all about? How does it work? Well, the D School has developed this five-step methodology that is called design thinking. So legal design is actually deriving from design thinking. And in this methodology, first, what you have to do is to empathize with your clients and also the end user, because your clients, they have clients. And so you have to also be aware of what is the, who is the end user and what do they need? So the first step is to empathize. It's empathy, understanding users' needs. Then it's about defining a problem, also defining a vision, getting creative to find new ideas so you can get to prototype those ideas into a tangible representation of what you envision to develop and you test it. And I think the testing is so important in the methodology and very under, underestimated. We tend to jump quickly whenever we have an idea into prototyping or even not even prototyping, actually, just developing the full, the full product without even asking users if this is going to be a, usable for them, if this is going to be useful for them. Legal design is about making everything more useful. It's about improving the quality of the experience. And this is why legal design is so powerful in order to enhance customer satisfaction, but also improve client retention, be also different on the market. So this is the methodology. I don't want to dive too deep into each of the steps. But instead, I'd like to show you that this is, this is a methodology that has been developed and that is recognized by some of the world's leading institutions, such as the Stanford Law School, that is so renowned for this methodology that they started in 2013 to experiment. But it even started before that. It actually started in 1992 in Switzerland when there was a PhD law student that actually got to use visuals in order to enhance the uh, capacity for people to understand the law. So this actually quite a lot of material that we can use in order to use legal design. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna to go too much into the definitions, but according to Margaret Hagan, which is considered one of the you know, world's pioneer, and it's really about bringing the human at the center of everything that we do in order to create new legal systems, new legal services that will bring more satisfaction to users, to clients, and to you as a professional. Tessa, can I just um, add a little yeah. of interjection here? Because what's really, what strikes me is that maybe some listeners or maybe some lawyers would say, well, hold on a second. Everything I do is for my client, right? Um, and surely I'm doing client-centric stuff all the time. But we know that the, the, the reality is that most of the stuff that lawyers do, especially in law firms, but not just, is actually very process driven, right? It's driven by, well, this is how a lawyer likes to work and how the legal process likes to do it. 
rather than, well, how does the client like to work, right? So it's actually, so while some, you know, while you kind of think, looking at this and saying, well, duh, surely all of this stuff is so obvious, but actually that's not the way it's being done. And 99% of the time, even now, it's not the way things are being done, right? Absolutely. I think the user research is key in the methodology. It's about talking more to your clients and to you potential users to understand really what are the pain points when they so say when they work with you. There's, there's always room for improvement, even if you feel you are super dedicated to your clients. Now, with the arrival of technology in the legal sector, there's so many new opportunities, new ways to operate, new ways to deliver services. Yeah. And before jumping into solutions, using technology or developing technology, what's even more important is to understand what are the pain points that are experienced by your clients when they work with you. So you can improve those processes, but also you can come up with a new product, with a new tool, a new solution that you could use with your clients in order to better collaborate, enhance transparency, um, you know, effectiveness, the speed of things, the speed of business, or you could use internally with your team. So there's so many possibilities, but it starts with talking more to your clients to really understand their pain points. And that means asking for feedback. And yeah. this is not easy. There's not, you know, we don't have a, a practice of asking for feedback because, yeah. you know, so we need to do more of that in order to start the journey. So it takes a lot of courage and humility as well to say, hey, I think I can do better. There's new technologies, there's other methodologies such as legal design, agile, and so many more. But first, let's, let's have a conversation and let's see how we can improve our services, but also the legal system in general. Yeah, I think what you say about conversation is quite, I mean, just a quick example. I know, Ben, you're, you're yeah. dying to have a question, but a quick example yeah. of this, right? When, when the, like, the COVID crisis hit, right, all the law firms started putting out all this content around, you know, force majeure clauses, right? And there, and there were actually complaints. It was, it, there were posts about this on LinkedIn where client, you know, in-house lawyers were complaining, saying, stop inundating my inbox with articles right. about force majeure. I don't want it. I don't care. I, this, it's, not my pro it's not the problem I'm experiencing. It doesn't help me. And that's a classic thing of like, well, I, maybe those law firms were thought they were being client-centric, but did they ask the client? Obviously not, because these clients are saying, oh, we're complaining about it. That's such a good, uh, that, that's a perfect lead in into the question that I wanted to ask Tessa, which was, if we remove legal from the legal design portion, design thinking has been around for a very, very long time. And it's had some incredible successes in terms of changing how organizations um, do business and the net results for Humanity. I know that there are examples of uh, hospitals totally sort of changing uh, how they do things and literally changing the health of people. It's a life and death that they've applied. Now, that, that's an aggressive example. But what I wanted to ask you is, what is an example of design thinking? What's your favorite example of design thinking applied to a business, a organization, or even something like a, um, or an institution or a service as it's sort of delivered, uh, just to sort of ground us and maybe something that we all know and like, or, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Are ATMs an example of design, of design thinking, uh, maybe, but what's your favorite example of design thinking well, applied to our world? ATM is certainly not an example of good design yeah, right. thinking. Like you are putting your card and then you get your money and then the card is still in the machine. It should, it should give you card first. So then you have your card and then you have your money, right? Otherwise you just lose, you forget your card in the machine. So certainly right. not ATM. But I want to share this story because I think it's going to be even easier to understand this story of Harry Ford. Okay. Harry Ford may not have known that he did design thinking at the time, but he really did because when he did, when he invented the car, he actually, and this is looping back to the conversation about understanding users' needs. Harry Ford did not ask what users wanted at the time because at the time, the only way to move from point A to point B was to ride a horse. 
And so if he had asked what people wanted, they would all have said, well, we want a faster horse. Build a faster horse for me. That's going to be yeah. saving all of my problems. When in fact, he said, well, wait a minute. Just tell me about, you know, when you move from point A to point B, wh why, why do you want to do that? And, and, mm -hmm. and how many, you know, like, are you going alone? Or do, you, do you bring your wife, your husband, your family, your friends? You know, how many people you need uh, to bring with you on this journey, you know? Because mm -hmm. on the horse, you mm -hmm. can have two, maybe three, if you have right. a kid, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, he understood also the pain points that, you know, it takes time, it's uncomfortable, you know, like say if it rains, like you get wet on a horse, you know? Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, well, if this is what you need, you need to move from point A to point B faster, in a more secure and safe way and with more comfort. Well, I'm going to mm -hmm. build a solution for you. And he invented right. the car, he prototyped different models before he yeah. actually got to create this, you know, like more robust product that actually works for wheel. But in the beginning, he just did something with two wheels or three wheels and four wheels. And I don't know, some steering wheel, you know, something like um, it looks like it doesn't look so serious, but it is the process of innovation right. that is has to be taken seriously. Not necessarily the first prototype, you know, it's just the first attempt to create something new. And in, in the law, what we need to do is this creative revolution, starting to think more creatively about what we do, about how we serve clients, about the kind of experience we are giving our clients. And for that, we need to find new ideas. And everybody is creative, including lawyers. Actually, lawyers are extremely creative. Just think about you know, the ability to come up with so many you know, legal arguments and to, you know, create a story and and then plead the case and understand like the law how it's applicable in the real life this is so creative we need to sort of reclaim our own imagination and creativity and use it in a way that is going to be productive in the legal sector and there's so many ways so let me just talk a little bit about not necessarily one example but all of the different possibilities that are available using legal design you can redesign information. So you can redesign contracts. Mm -hmm. And there's many cases of contracts that have been redesigned using visuals. But you can also create a product. That means you create a tool, a tool. And I think Majodo is the perfect example of that. It's a tool that allows to accomplish specific tasks in a much better way in a way that is you know, more collaborative and then more in sync with what users need today. You could create a service. So you know, we could think about an entire journey from, again, point A to point B. You, you would like a contract to be negotiated and signed and executed. Can we create a, a full experience that, that is digital to monitor that? Can we create an organization that is designed with people and processes so we can be more efficient? Can we create new systems? I mean, the justice system, that's a perfect representation of what is system design, but mm -hmm. maybe we can improve it. Or maybe we can create new systems. And this is what I want to talk. One example of one of the most groundbreaking innovation that they have developed using this methodology that is Kleros, that is um, blockchain, yeah. Justices, yeah, right. Justice, I don't know how they call it, justice on the blockchain, blockchain mm -hmm. justice. And it has some really smart, there's a, there's a really smart philosophy behind it to find ways to resolve disputes much faster by using the blockchain and the pool of independent juries that could be you and I, because they have a system that, you know, like really... I wouldn't be able to explain it because it's, it's, I don't know if any of you know how to explain the system. I mean, the system is easy. This, I think this is what is key. It's easy for the user, even if it's complex behind, right? right. What matters right. is people can solve the disputes. That's yeah. what they want to yeah. do. They don't want to know the whole system. Like the, the watch, you know, who wants to know how, how this works inside? I, I don't need yeah. to know. I don't want to know. I just want to know like I have the time. Yeah. I think that you know that example with the access to justice is really um, yeah. is a really interesting one because one of the kind of 
uh, you know, you're also going back to the your earlier question, Ben, you know, the question was what, you know, why, why do we want to start applying legal design? Is it, how, is it important or is it a mm -hmm. nice thing? Um, mm -hmm. And the reality is when we think about some of the kind of, you know, the big situations out there, mm -hmm. um, we've got, we've, we've got some serious crises out there in the wider world. Right. But there's also some serious right. crises inside legal. So access to justice um, is a, is a, is a huge issue and that's accessibility and the time and the cost of getting justice, right? Um, so mm -hmm. how do you solve that? Um, you know, kind of e equality. So, um, you know, even outside of the court system, equality to, to legal help and services and tools um, and contracts and also an access accessibility to that is um, it's very, very uh, it, it equal. Um, trust, you know, the trust in institutions um, and trust in sort of public bodies. And, you know, the, the law is very closely tied to all of that. Um, so, how, you know, how do you solve all these uh, crises where well, you can't solve them with, in, in, you know, with, I don't know, process efficiency, um, right? You've, you've got to solve them by looking at the end user. And that's where design, um, design thinking comes into it. And, you know, outside of legal, if you think about product design or, I don't know, app, you know software and apps and kind of gaming and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those, those fields have been just, they, they've built, they're built on design thinking. Right um, for, from the from the beginning. So, um, but so much of what um, is in legal has has lagged behind. And so, it's not it's not a nice yeah. to have. It's it's absolutely essential. And of course, outside of these kind of access to just justice situations, it's just you know it's just as important in a business in a business to business. I mean, if you if you look at all the the, the things that businesses and GCs are concerned about, it's things like well, I don't know where my contracts and my data is, right? Or um, my deal times take too long or the contract process doesn't, you know, destroys trust instead of building it, right? Yeah. Um, so again, you, you, how are you gonna solve these things? You can't solve tr trust issues with, you know, with kind of tinkering with process and making things go a little bit faster. Right? Yes, I, um, I just need to say it because, you know, I love to quote Einstein if I'm not quoting Steve Jobs or Henry Ford, the, um, the thinking that got us that, created today's problems will not solve uh, those problems moving forward, right? So Tessa, I, um, let's, let's try to thread this together. I love the Henry Ford example. And I think I'll play back what I got to you, which was Henry Ford was only able to really come up with the idea of a car, even if he didn't use the words design uh, thinking through design. So design thinking was a methodology that allowed him to drive an innovation called the car to solve the problems in a, in a holistic, complete way that was afflicting the, the transportation of 1910, right? Um, that, that was the problem. There was a transportation problem of 1910. Okay, so now from there, we have 2021 problems. We have 2021 legal problems, be it uh, to Dennis' point, the idea of access to justice, um, but also on the business side, right? General counsels and in, in-house sort of responding with the speed of business. And of course, uh, the least contentious thing that we're going to say in this entire um, webinar is that the world is speeding up and going faster. I don't, I, I literally don't think that anybody can even argue with that, right? Um, and our end users, are demanding much more, more than ever before, uh, because they also need to speed up. So that gets us into a nice place. And I think uh, that that sort of gets us to the, to the next portion of it, which is um, let's focus this on, um, if we could, law firms and how they can use design thinking, just like Henry Ford did, uh, to help service their clients. And I, and I think I'd also like to get Dennis's perspective because he has an in-house perspective and he's also consulted in this capacity about how, how is it that law firms are really um, the, using design thinking like Henry Ford does, uh, used design thinking to really service uh, their most important client, uh, which they took an oath to, to, to do everything that they could for um, on the in-house side or on the end user side. So can, can we get into that? And then Dennis, mm -hmm. of course, jump in, jump in and say like, from an in-house perspective, this was fantastic and this changed my world. Whenever I saw the car or the equivalent of a car, it, it changed my life, you know, in that way. 
Well, thanks, Denise. Well, the, the thing is, we all, I mean, maybe as legal professional, we're not fully aware how complex law is, although it is really complex, even for a legal professional. But imagine for, for businesses, for organizations, for people, it's really difficult mm -hmm. for them to understand. They get totally disinterested in, in the law. Uh, you know, this is probably um, one of the reasons I actually got to do so much work in Brazil. So let me share about this personal and professional experience. In Brazil, there is a huge backlog of close to 100 millions of cases in the court system. And uh, those numbers are just so insane. Like how, like Denny said, how can you do you, how can you improve the processes and hope to reduce the backlog of 100 million of cases in the courts? You need mm -hmm. to change your mindset. You need to change your perspective and you need to find completely new solutions for people to have interest in you know, their rights, in what they're allowed to do, what they're supposed to do, not to do. And for business and organizations and society to operate in a much better way for relationships, relationships to be you know, uh, you know, like based on a mutual understanding of, you know, what we're supposed to do and not to do. So I think this is one thing we need to be aware of, that we need to make law easier, sort of simpler, although I don't really like simpler, but, you know, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. I think this is yes. a quote from... The, uh, yes, the second Italian. order, second yeah. order simplicity. Yes, right. For yes. sure. Yeah. And we're all running out of time. We, we have no time to lose. Like you have said it, and we all know we have no time. Our users have no time. Our clients have no time. We need to be, we need to be able to deliver outcomes. Nobody wakes up one day and say, hey, I want to have legal services. I want to buy legal services. People have problems. They want solutions. And so we tend in the legal sector to understand, to explain the steps, you know, oh, we're going to do this and then we're going to do that. But people, what they want, they want outcomes. How can we deliver justice outcomes to people and to businesses? And with this information overload, like we have no time. We, visuals are everywhere now because we have no time to read. Like personally, since the pandemic, I haven't read one single blog post. I'm, I'm listening <laughs> to podcasts. I'm watching videos. Uh, I don't have time to read. It just takes too, time, too much time. A podcast is much easier and faster. We need to start thinking of those new mediums to communicate, to showcase. And this is also how legal design can help. And visuals are everywhere every day with this, this COVID-19. Like, this is one of the best examples of how to make sure that people will comply. Use visuals, make the text easier to understand, um, you know, move from passive to active, you know, like, you know, stay home if you're sick, don't, don't use a, a complex language, you know, make it easy. And many clients now do and want legal design. This, this was this great piece, you have probably have read it from the Financial Times recently, how design thinking can help lawyers do a better job. I highly recommend you read it. It was published in the Financial Times and all of those organizations are using it to redesign the contracts, to rethink the processes, to bring people at the center of everything they do, their people and their clients. And even judge are asking for it. I told you in Brazil, there's so many cases. Now there's been a decision that has been taken by the National Judicial Council, if I may say. They say, whenever possible, we need to use visual law to communicate our laws, to communicate our processes, to make it easier for people to understand. And in Australia, they are designing a courthouse that is just more user-friendly, that people don't feel threatened to go there. It's just more, a better experience. Mm -hmm. okay. Dennis, what, yeah. what do you Dennis, have yes, the perfect, perfect segue into you, Dennis, and, and talking from your in-house perspective on, you know, how did you feel? How did it help your job to be done whenever design thinking was applied to the uh, to the service that you were being given or the, or the information that you were being given, almost using Tessa's entire, you know, that, that, that hierarchy. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, look, what, what I actually found was that um, as an in-house lawyer, you were doing that p design piece for your, mm -hmm. for your um, business customers, right? Because right. stuff, when, when you did get stuff from lawyers, you always needed to translate it, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, 
I think there was probably once or twice um, when there was something quite sort of particularly functional and technical where a law firm was using a spreadsheet to collect some like data, co collect and convey some information about data protection laws in different countries, right? But, but for the most part, um, you know, and, and I'm sure this is to a large extent, this is still the case now, you're writing emails, right? In the past it was letters, now it's emails, right? And you're sending out your advice in an email. Um, and then I, as an in-house lawyer, have to go and translate it um, for, uh, in two ways. One is that I have to figure out, well, how does this apply to the business? Well, that's fine. Maybe mm -hmm. the lawyer doesn't, can't do that because that's the whole point of an in-house lawyer. But I'm also translating it into something that the business can understand, whether that's right. in word or pictures. Um, and, and my sort of, in, in a way, uh, my design journey started with, with, with this and that I, I was working in, yeah. in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a global headquarters um, here in Italy where the language was English, but 90% of the people were not native English speakers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you had to communicate things in a simple way. Plus, it was all the usual pressures. So, you know, I quickly realized that with a lot of these um, um, with my my business clients, I couldn't write uh, an email. They didn't understand it. Right. So I had to do it visually. So I started using things like traffic lights, reports and sort of balanced scorecards and kind of very visual um, uh, reporting on risk. And what I found is that when you do it that way, you have to become more specific and braver because with an email, you can in introduce all sorts of caveat, yeah, right. fancy legal stuff to say, well, it's probably like this, but I'm not sure and don't, don't, you know, don't come back to me if, I'm if it turns out to be wrong. But if you put <laughs> a traffic light of you know, yellow, orange, red, right. you, you've got to stick your neck out, right? And that makes you yeah. a better business person and a better lawyer, right? You've got to stick your neck out. Um, but it's something that the client understands. And frankly, like one of my clients said, look, I get it that a green does not mean it's 100% safe. I'm not stupid. Right. I'm a reason guy. I just know that green is low risk, right? You don't need to even explain that right. to me. Um, and, that, and that's the language that really works and, it's, and it creates trust and it creates speed. It creates clarity um, uh, for everyone. And I, and I wonder how many um, uh, law firms out there, um, are, and, and even in-house lawyers as well, who are still primarily using descriptive you know, sentences and email to give advice and to uh, 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 and recommendations to the business, um, and th and that's that's just you know one example of of the whole thing. And what what I would say, you know, why is it important for law firms? Well, it's important for law firms because it's important for businesses, and everything that law firms do is for their business right. clients. Right. 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 Um, I would add one other sort of thing. Um, I, I was talking, and in fact, it's more than one. I have talked to one or two professional kind of services companies, um, stroke law firms. I've been I'll be intentionally vague. Um, who have who, you know, who have an in-house design team. So they have like legal designers that they've recruited and who work. But what they always seem to be doing is that doing, doing purely internal stuff. And what really sort of struck me is that they were not using this, these legal designers to mm -hmm. deliver proper designed customer facing um, content, right? And, and to me, that's nuts, right? So I know that there are some law firms, uh, you know, the most, the most innovative and best law firms are doing something more on that front. Um, but I guess I, I suspect that the, the majority are sort of s still kind of behind and really missing out on the opportunity that this brings. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so Dennis, let's just stick with you and then we'll bring, and then Tessa can come back in because I think that she can, she's really good at sort of laying down the, uh, the theory layer and then uh, placing it. but. Why don't you talk a little bit about Majoto uh, and how that sprung up? And I'm assuming that it sprung up from 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 this from this time in house. Um, and uh, what 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 is Majoto doing? What's the what's the problem that it's specifically solving? And then obviously contextualize it within the context of how it's important for or how it's leveraging uh, legal design um, in that capacity. All right. Okay. I'll try to do this in a really compressed way. If I yeah. stop you on a bit, you stop me because uh, this is, yeah, I'm passionate. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. Go on for miles. Um, <laughs> let me put it this way. Um, the problem that we're solving, right, is right. one of relationships, right? So if you think about, um, you know, the, 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 the world out there, the economy, we live in this kind of crazy, fast-paced, uh, nuts environment, where you know you've got social distancing, you've got technology, you've got glo globalization, you've got cloud, um, you've got all this sort of stuff, and all of it makes relationships that much more important 
right? Because it's, you know, that human experience is being challenged. So relationships are much, are much more important than ever. And yet they're harder than ever, right? And if you think about all the successful companies um, that are just killing it out there, they are all focused on building that relationship and then creating that sort of flywheel effect that comes from that relationship. You know, Amazon, Salesforce, Disney, um, you know, Apple, Apple Google. Yeah. Net right? Netflix, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So, so they're, they're they're really good at building that trust and then sort of go, you know, kind of expanding that further and 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 ultimately monetizing it, right? Um, and and I think that's really that's critical. So, in this economy, those who are good at relationships, the businesses that are good at relationships, including law firms, <laughs> uh, will win, and those who are not will will lose, right? So, so to, to me, that's that that was a that's the problem that we're solving here. Because what I've seen in in my own practice and also as an advisor and a consultant, um, is that you know whenever you get to that to anything legal and let's you know specifically contracts, but not only, um, right. that relationship thing just comes comes under pressure. I always think about this as a trust curve. So you know the business the businesses start to get together. The, 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 you know, the business guys are making a deal, building relationships, and the trust curve is rising. And then, and then mm -hmm. it's time for the lawyers to exchange contracts. Yeah, right. Drops, right? right? And then you yeah, get into right. It. right. So why is that? Um, and that doesn't, you know, that doesn't help to build relationships. So majority is all is is all about that. Um, but in terms of in terms of where we sort of, how we sort of started with this, well, how you know how do you do this relationship thing? And and the answer was well, look, solving those kind of again, like I said, solving those process issues it doesn't solve those relationships. Doing stuff faster internally does not solve the relationship problem. So we've got to do something different. Um, so the way we start looking at this really is a, it's a bit like, um, funny that Tessa was using the, 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 you know, the horse uh, and you as well, Ben, because I, I always thought of contracts as, as, as a horse, right? So it's a horse that gets you from A to B, um, right. you know, business of result, right? Um, right. And, and, you know, the, min the minimum in the minimum way, right? Exactly. Right. exactly. But traditionally, right. it was a po it was traditionally it was a post horse, right? You you right. exchange written contracts on a parchment by post horse, right? Um, right? And then you know, word and email replicates the exactly same process, more efficiently, sure. but it's the same process. And then all the tech that I was seeing was replicating the same process. It, it's not word and email, but it's an editor and some kind of messaging system, right? that essentially replicates the, the, the same process. And what struck, always struck me is that that process does not build trust or relationships. It's an adversarial. Mm -hmm. It forces you to think about the detail instead of the big picture. You know, the track changing is just kind of gets people into that pernickety, you know, adversarial kind of untrusting sort of- um, oh, it, I'm getting stressed just thinking about I, it. Yeah. I know, I know. And it's an everyday problem for, for every business. Um, so, so again, so how do you sort of fix that? So for us, you know, we don't want to build a horse. We don't want to automate a horse. We don't want to make a mechanical horse. We want to build something on wheels. And that's what Mojoto is. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, start, you, and we're starting with something quite, I mean, the, the, our first product is actually built on Google Workspace, right? So it's basically because we, we want something really collaborative, especially something that enables real-time collaboration. And we wanted to leverage the best collaboration system out there. So we built Mojoto on Google Workspace and we're building it out in, in other platforms that are uh, you know, agnostic uh, as well. But that's where, we, that's where we're starting with. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, I'd, I'd probably talk, I, I, maybe I might show you a visual just to kind of explain what is this design, what, what can you do with this design process? Um, and what can you do with Mojoto? And how does it sort of all translate? Um, I think that's a great example. A great example. Okay. Let's do that. And what I would love is for Tessa to point out some of the underlining design strategies, design thinking strategies that have manifested itself in something like Majoto. So maybe thinking about sort of empathy, thinking about end user experience, thinking about jobs to be done, thinking about pains and gains, social, you know, all, all of this. So yeah, so let, let's do this and then Tessa can sort of add in an editorial layer about why this is, is or uh, is, you know, sort of a good manifestation, a good end product of something. So yeah, go ahead. So can you see my screen, inverted pyramid? Yep. Okay, yep. fantastic. So look, um, and not all of this is Mojoto, but it, all of it is design, right? Um, so this actually comes from a real piece of work that we did um, uh, for, for a customer. And just to sort of paint the picture, they had this problem where they were doing, um, uh, they, they, have an, they have a SaaS kind of product and they were starting to contract with, you know, they're an SME, 
they were starting to contract with some really big multinationals. And these multinationals would send them their 100 page MSAs, right? And they'd get stuck in these negotiations for months uh, and, and over a year in some cases, right? So we worked together to sort of um, see if we could design a, a, a contract for them that would um, uh, um, meet the, the needs of these enterprise customers, but still be a contract that's fit for purpose for their SaaS, right? So, they, so, they, so just to increase that, um, uh, the speed of the, of, of the deals. So what we started to do is, um, is, is actually build a contract from scratch. And the, and, the re and the way we started is not how everyone starts drafting contracts, which is, well, I'm gonna pull out some precedents and Frankenstein them and glue them together into some sort of mm -hmm. monster, right? We started from, from scratch. And starting from scratch means starting from the very, very most important thing. And that is why, right? Why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this contract, right? And from that, we build out a few, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but we build out three core objectives, which were basically the purpose of this whole contract. And from the, and those core objectives were common to both the customer and their clients, right? There were joint objectives. And from that objective, we built out basically the elements of, of the contract. Um, and eventually that turned into an, an agreement map. And, uh, and now this is, this is now in Majoto, right? So inside Majoto, we created this um, agreement map, which basically maps these three uh, joint objectives and then maps the different elements of the contract and eventually the, 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 the core sections of the contract. So what, what, what did that help? So, so what did that do for us? First of all, it enabled us to create a contract that was where everything inside the contract was directly related to a joint purpose for both parties. So that, mean, that meant that the contract was A, 100% efficient, right? There was no crap. Um, and secondly, um, we, we were able to demonstrate to the other side that this contract is just right. It's fit for purpose, right? Um, the second thing that we're able to do with that is we actually included this agreement map at the beginning of the contract. So when the other side gets this contract, um, they get to see a little introductory statement, which you can't see here, which explains wh wh where we're coming from, um, and then gives you the map as a way of sort of saying, look, this is what you, you're now going to be reviewing, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, we used, uh, uh, so this, this is a sort of a design pattern that is built into Majoto. So you can sort of select different design patterns and incorporate them in. And this particular one is, a, is, is called a, a sort of an objectives led agreement map. Um, and then what we uh, were able to do is use other design patterns and the design capability inside Majoto to actually draft um, uh, the, the agreement itself. So this is a page, uh, a, a page grab from uh, one of the um, uh, sections of the contract and it has uh, a sort of a swim lane. So a swim lane is a classic design pattern which basically conveys who's responsible for, for what among the, the two parties. So it's, 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 it's more readable than text, it's more readable than the table, and it's also quite a nice tool for, for people to sort of, um, uh, especially for the business to kind of align on and really understand, well, who's doing what? And it gives you a real sort of nice visual sort of impression. Well, who's got the bulk of the um, activities, right? Who, who's got the bulk, who's doing the bulk of the effort here? Um, so this is just an example of a design of a, it's a classic design pattern. We didn't invent mm -hmm. it, but it's, uh, it's a classic one. And this is an example of, of, of the way that you can draft contracts to introduce visual patterns, introduce sort of design elements like descriptive um, headings and things like that to basically make contracts easier to understand, easier to negotiate and help people get on the same page. And yeah. uh, so that's the sort of the process we, we, we applied, which is a, which is a combination of um, a particular design model that I apply to contracts, which is this, um, this, this inverted pyramid, plus the Majoto capability. And the result was a 50 to 80% reduction in deal, in, in deal times. Simple yeah. as that. Okay, yeah. And, and even more so, you know, and then I want to ask Tessa to sort of pull back the curtain on how you were able to do this and place this and anything else you want to answer. But, you know, one of the, at the net, net, net of all of this was, an 80% reduction in or 50% reduction in terms of contract time, right? Which everybody, every, yeah, right. Everybody, everybody's loving, right? Um, more agreement, less hostility. Um, and the lawyer is all of a sudden a superhero, right? Because he or she or they are kind of bringing speed uh, to uh, this deal. And oh, by the way, not killing trust not killing relationships not killing business flow right it's and uh and, and this is um if you could you know for 
it seems like the lawyer now is walking around and, and their day to day is something closer to um, a deal maximizer or a deal efficiency creator, right? Um, and moreover, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dennis, but you know, removing yourself from the details now allows that lawyer as well uh, to be dealing with higher strategic, more more important initiatives. Is that is that a good characterization of the the night and day uh, change? And oh, by the way, like you know, did I reach Nirvana as well? I'm not sure. Some sort yeah. of spiritual enlightenment. It could be. Let, let, I mean, Tessa, what do you think? I mean, to me, I thought that that's a brilliant summary, right? Because it, it just <laughs> it captures everything. Because it captures what we've done, but it captures all that corollary, um, all, the, all, the, all the other sort of outcomes, the, the sort of, um, um, yeah, the, yeah what's, what's the word? The, um, I'm, I'm try, I can't find the right word, but it's, um, it's the collateral. It's not the collateral damage that lawyers are often creating, it's the collateral positive outcomes that come from starting to work that way. I, what, what do you think, Tessa? Well, absolutely. I think this, uh, there's so many great things about Majodo and what Denise has created. I mean, like to me, to, 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 you know, like, I feel like um, it's, it's just a, like, how can I, how can I evaluate Denise's work? I mean, it's right, amazing, yeah. right? Like, what can I say? Except like, it's mind blowing. You know, that, that's all I can say. It's amazing. It's an amazing tool, but also he used the process in a sublime way because he really got to understand users' motivations beyond the industry standards. He, you know, like what I really like about Dennis' work and, and tool that he went beyond the standard to really, as you say, like move from this horse to create something on wheel so we can mm -hmm. speed up the process, but also make sure we are actually building rapport, trust, and we're making sure that law is supporting the business and not actually killing it because that's unfortunately what happens so many times. I mean, just think about even like, you know, like recently I got to receive a contract that was so long. I didn't want to make the deal anymore. It was just like, I couldn't understand nothing. I was like, what am I signing? You know, <laughs> can no, I make I, I, this? I don't want I mean, to buy the banana anymore. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, awesome. and I'm pretty sure like all of you can relate. Like sometimes you, you make deals for your personal life, you know, and then you're like, oh my God, this, this, this is so long and painful. We need to acknowledge this. And I think that this is the first courageous element. And this is the first brave step that Danis took to acknowledge this is not working. He spent 20 years in-house. He's got a lot of experience and he say, well, this is not working. We need to use our imagination to do something different. And for that, he used visuals. He create also visuals that you know, like it's easier to read for us to understand. It's enjoyable, brings more satisfaction because it's new, big novelty. It's like wow, this is new, and now legal design is becoming almost mainstream. I mean, it's getting there. At least it's getting there. In five years, in ten years, in twenty years, this is the way the business of law is going to operate using legal yeah. design as a methodology and tools that have been developed using this methodology, whether they integrate tech or sometimes uh, they just, uh, you know, nicer PDFs uh, or, or ways to communicate information. And yeah. so I think this is just brilliant what uh, Danis has created. And I really hope you're gonna give this platform a try because it's gonna change your perception of how to work and how to collaborate with other professionals and how to deliver services to your clients. And the best way is to experiment. Yeah. Attitude yeah. is everything. Look, we've talked a lot about legal design. You start to see the methodology, how it works, but your attitude is everything. If you don't have the right attitude, everything we have said in this webinar is worth nothing because you need to be able to open yourself to those new ideas. You need to be able to start experimenting new things and testing and you know sometimes admitting that if if we fail like we're learning we're learning and we're getting closer to something that will make us truly outstanding but yeah. if we're not ready to do that if we're just ready to repeat our, our, the, our ways of doing what's going to happen is the world is moving in this direction because in fact legal design 
it's the application of design thinking in the law with the last, last industry to use design thinking. So if we're not doing it, the world is moving forward. Banking got disrupted, got fully digital. You know, you talked about hospital, that Ben. There's some great examples in health, finances, you know, and the environment. We have so many new things happening and law is staying stuck in what I call paper world. Yeah. I, uh, we're, we're coming up to the end of our time. And I think what I want to do is um, I, I want Tessa to sort of bring us home a little bit and talk a little bit about legal creatives, because I think legal creatives um, is a good first step in terms of thinking about your journeys. I can't remember who, but somebody once said, you know, uh, how you perceive the world is based on your theory. And in some sense, uh, legal creatives um, and design thinking is offering you a new theory. We're not asking you to, I mean, in some sense, legal design isn't really asking you to uh, throw away everything that you know, but this is a tool that can help you see more, deeper, better, uh, more updated, uh, and in a deeper way. So why don't you talk a little bit about the work that Legal Creatives is doing um, and specifically how lawyers can uh, take that first jump if they're so sort of disposed to okay. see more see more of the world. Well, what we do at Legal Creatives, we are entirely dedicated to this education that is so much needed. So we get to acquire those new methodologies, develop those new skills, uh, find the courage and the community to try new things, to you know, think creatively about the law so we can make new proposals and potentially bold proposals. So what we do is we have completely reinvented legal education and, and maybe even education at large. What we do is we, we, we have realized that the way we learn is so not engaging. It's so not interactive and it's really, you know, to be honest, most of the trainings are pretty, you know, pretty boring, we have to be honest. And we say, let's make learning an experience. Let's make learning insightful. Let's be sure that we apply what we preach in our own educational platform. So infusing design thinking in the way we deliver the content, making the content, you know, easier to digest, but also more actionable so we can get to focus on implementation and not just the theory because learning the theory of legal design is you know it's not going to take you a long time i mean you could you, you've learned a lot today on this webinar but now the key is to implement and to try new things and to think creatively so we've built this platform where we have different series we call them the legal design series we have one on visual contracts by design we created this user research in legal design to share about what are the metrics you need to monitor whenever you do a legal design project or product and how you get to actually uh, measure the outcome and the return on investment of uh, legal design. We are doing those uh, challenges where we bring our learners together from all around the world. So we have learners from everywhere, all continents, and they're coming together for some legal design challenges to get to practice in small teams their legal design skills. Right now we're doing the App Store Legal Design Challenge where we are working on using our skills to prototype some solutions to ensure digital privacy for all. The objective is not necessarily to achieve this outcome. The outcome is to learn, to practice and to network. But you know, I'm pretty sure some members are gonna come up with pretty good ideas that can be turned into business solutions. So we focused a lot on creativity, ideation, creating new solutions. This is just some screenshots of what we've done. This visual contract by design was the most popular because there's a hype for visuals in contracts and I understand it. It makes, it makes the information so much easier to understand. And it's not as difficult as developing a tech solution as well. So the return on investment of visual contracting is big. And this legal design UX research as well, which I think is really important to measure the outcome of legal design, to show that legal design is, is allowing for um, legal services to be more effective, to be also more usable and to you know, enhance satisfaction. This is why legal design is a lot about making sure you are making your clients happier. 
because they will they will have a new experience of working with you working in the law and they will love it actually we have so many feedback from our members who are using those methodologies and they say wow you know we have great feedback yeah, we even certifying now uh sorry dennis no no i, was just, I, I thought you were finishing i was going to say that i've actually done one of tessa's courses um and it was absolutely fantastic and you know it's it's sort of educational and inspirational and and the the sort of the people that you kind of meet uh on these courses also become really sort of important um parts of your network. So um, I think I think what Tess is doing with, a, with that education and kind of democratizing legal design and legal design education, I think is, is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and, and the focus on doing, I mean, there's, there's very kind of little time spent on theory in Tess's courses, it's, it's, it's all about doing. Um, and I think that's so important because doing, you, you, you learn this stuff by doing, in my view. Yeah. Absolutely, especially this methodology is all about the attitude and for that you need to do to build the confidence because you have new competencies. And for that we having this legal design expert practitioner that is new and we had our first cohort in February it was amazing. This was the feedback we got from this cohort. They really loved it from the USA, from South America, from Europe, Eastern Europe. Um, it was just amazing to see all of, you know, all of those professionals coming together to learn and to practice. And so that's, that's what we do. And uh, I think we have a special deal for the Nexel members. So feel free to check out the, my page and the legal creatives page on the Nexel business of law community. We're going to do more of those talks, right then? Yes, we are. So I, uh, we have taken so much of these beautiful people, these beautiful minds, their, uh, their, their time. It's been absolutely fantastic speaking with you. You know, my takeaway to this is for everybody listening to this, you know, if you are a person that wants to either help uh, access to justice, if you're a person who wants to compete um, and deliver better services as an in-house lawyer, or if you're a lawyer who understands that there's a, uh, a, a more sophisticated way, a better, uh, not more complicated, but just more, more uh, a better, smarter, uh, more seamless uh, experience that you can deliver to your clients. If you're somebody who yearns uh, to look for something like that, I, I implore you to think about this idea of design thinking. The methodology has been tested, it's been proven, it is working, and the truth is, is that the world is going this way anyway. So why not sort of jump on board today uh, and, and sort of take advantage uh, and actually empower yourself rather than sort of be dragged along. So that's my bold provocative statement. I want to thank both Dennis and Tessa for sharing all of this today. Uh, like you said, we are um, going to be featuring Tessa's course within the Business of Law community. Um, and Dennis, of course, as a member of the Nexel community, um, we'll be featuring him as well. And we'll put a link uh, to Majoto um, and you can start to test that as well. So let's do some final closing words from both Dennis and Tessa. Um, just thank you so much. Any parting words for, for, for anybody who's listening today? Tessa, you go first. Well, yeah. look, if you've been inspired, if you got the spark, just get started, do something, connect with us. Um, you know, let's have a chat in, uh, it doesn't have to be formal. We can have a casual chat and just, you know, if you have this spark, ignite it because, you know, you, it means there's something there you need, you need to explore. So I wish you a great journey and it would be a pleasure to help you achieve your objectives in this space. Thanks, Dennis. Awesome. I, I, there's not so much to add. I mean, it's been a real pleasure. So thank you, um, Ben and, T and Tessa, for inviting me on. Um, I mean, I'll just say maybe that, look, that some of the stuff that we've talked about sounds, and it is, lofty and grandiose, but all of it is it's, it's real day-to-day -day stuff, right? Um, and, um, and, it, and it's going to be, and, and your clients, whether it's you're an in-house lawyer and it's the business or you're a law firm, are going to relate to it and they're going to love it. So again, it's a question of you know, thinking about this as, as both big picture and everyday practice um, and just start applying it. Talk to people um, who've, who've, who've done this, who can get you kickstarted. Um, that would be my advice. 
Yeah. And look at all the great things that we did with the car, right? So if you want to be the Henry Ford and, uh, and, and open, open the world up to new ways and uh, what could, what, what could, what could the equivalent and could look like in a, uh, in legal, uh, certainly a very promising future. Um, so join, join that movement if you're inspired. So uh, we'll go ahead and close off Dennis Potemkin, CEO and founder of Majoto, I know you love how I say it, uh, and, and, Tessa, and Tessa Manuelo, uh, the CEO and the founder of Legal Creatives. Thank you so much for being here on the Nexo Fireside Chat. It was a pleasure. We will speak to you soon, okay? Thank goodbye, you very everybody. much. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Goodbye.